A Holy Terror by Ambrose Bierce 1. There was an entire lack of interest in the latest arrival at Hurdy-Gurdy. He was not even christened with the picturesquely descriptive nickname, which is so frequently a mining camp's word of welcome to the newcomer. In almost any other camp thereabout, this circumstance would of itself have secured him some such appellation as the white-headed conundrum or no sarve, an expression naively supposed to suggest to quick intelligences the Spanish quien sabe. He came without provoking a ripple of concern upon the social surface of hurdy-gurdy, a place which, to the general Californian contempt of men's personal history, superadded a local indifference of its own. The time was long past when it was of any importance who came there, or if anybody came. No one was living at Hurdy-Gurdy. Two years before, the camp had boasted a stirring population of two or three thousand males and not fewer than a dozen females. A majority of the former had done a few weeks' earnest work in demonstrating, to the disgust of the latter, the singularly mendacious character of the person whose ingenious tales of rich gold deposits had lured them thither, work, by the way, in which there was as little mental satisfaction as pecuniary profit, for a bullet from the pistol of a public-spirited citizen had put that imaginative gentleman beyond the reach of aspersion on the third day of the camp's existence. Still, his fiction had a certain foundation, in fact, and many had lingered a considerable time in and about hurdy-gurdy, though now all had been long gone. But they had left ample evidence of their sojourn. From the point where Injun Creek falls into the Rio San Juan Smith, up along both banks of the former into the canyon whence it emerges, extended a double row of forlorn shanties that seemed about to fall upon one another's neck to bewail their desolation, while about an equal number appeared to have straggled up the slope on either hand and perched themselves upon commanding eminences, whence they craned forward to get a good view of the affecting scene. Most of these habitations were emaciated as by famine to the condition of mere skeletons, about which clung unlovely tatters of what might have been skin, but was really canvas. The little valley itself, torn and gashed by pick and shovel, was unhandsome, with long bending lines of decaying flume resting here and there upon the summits of sharp ridges, and stilting awkwardly across the intervals upon unhewn poles. The whole place presented that raw and forbidding aspect of arrested development, which is a new country's substitute for the solemn grace of ruin wrought by time. Wherever there remained a patch of the original soil, a rank overgrowth of weeds and brambles had spread upon the scene, and from its dank, unwholesome shades the visitor, curious in such matters, might have obtained numberless souvenirs of the camp's former glory, fellowless boots mantled with green mould and plethoric of rotting leaves, an occasional old felt hat, desultory remnants of a flannel shirt, sardine boxes inhumanly mutilated, and a surprising profusion of black bottles distributed with a truly Catholic impartiality everywhere. 2. The man who had now rediscovered Hurdy-Gurdy was evidently not curious as to its archaeology, nor as he looked about him upon the dismal evidences of wasted work and broken hopes, their dispiriting significance accentuated by the ironical pomp of a cheap gilding by the rising sun, did he supplement his sigh of weariness by one of sensibility. He simply removed from the back of his tired burrow a miner's outfit a trifle larger than the animal itself, picketed that creature, and, selecting a hatchet from his kit, 
moved off at once across the dry bed of Injun Creek to the top of a low, gravelly hill beyond. Stepping across a prostrate fence of brush and boards, he picked up one of the latter, split it into five parts, and sharpened them at one end. He then began a kind of search, occasionally stooping to examine something with close attention. At last, his patient scrutiny appeared to be rewarded with success, for he suddenly erected his figure to its full height, made a gesture of satisfaction, pronounced the word scarry, and at once strode away with long, equal steps, which he counted. Then he stopped and drove one of his stakes into the earth. He then looked carefully about him, measured off a number of paces over a singularly uneven ground, and hammered in another. Pacing off twice the distance at a right angle to his former course, he drove down a third, and, repeating the process, sank home the fourth and then a fifth. This he split at the top, and in the cleft inserted an old letter envelope covered with an intricate system of pencil tracks. In short, he staked off a hill claim in strict accordance with the local mining laws of hurdy-gurdy, and put up the customary notice. It is necessary to explain that one of the adjuncts to hurdy-gurdy, one to which that metropolis became afterward itself an adjunct, was a cemetery. In the first week of the camp's existence, this had been thoughtfully laid out by a committee of citizens. The day after had been signalized by a debate between two members of the committee with reference to a more eligible site, and on the third day the necropolis was inaugurated by a double funeral. As the camp had waned, the cemetery had waxed, and long before the ultimate inhabitant, victorious alike over the insidious malaria and the forthright revolver, had turned the tail of his pack-ass upon Injun Creek, the outlying settlement had become a populous, if not popular, suburb. And now, when the town was fallen into the sere and yellow leaf of an unlovely senility, the graveyard, though somewhat marred by time and circumstance, and not altogether exempt from innovations in grammar and experiments in orthography, to say nothing of the devastating coyote, answered the humble needs of its denizens with reasonable completeness. It comprised a generous two acres of ground, which, with commendable thrift but needless care, had been selected for its mineral unworth, contained two or three skeleton trees, one of which had a stout lateral branch, from which a weather-wasted rope still significantly dangled, half a hundred gravelly mounds, a score of rude headboards displaying the literary peculiarities above mentioned, and a struggling colony of prickly pears. Altogether, God's location, as with characteristic reverence it had been called, could justly boast of an indubitably superior quality of desolation. It was in the most thickly settled part of this interesting domain that Mr. Jefferson Doman staked off his claim. If, in the prosecution of his design, he should deem it expedient to remove any of the dead, they would have the right to be suitably reinterred. 3. This Mr. Jefferson Doman was from Elizabeth Town, New Jersey, where six years before he had left his heart in the keeping of a golden-haired, demure-mannered young woman named Mary Matthews, as collateral security for his return to claim her hand. I just know you'll never get back alive. You never do succeed in anything, was the remark which illustrated Miss Matthews's notion of what constituted success and, inferentially, her view of the nature of encouragement. She added, If you don't, I'll go to California, too. I can put the coins in little bags as you dig them out. This characteristically feminine theory of auriferous deposits did not commend itself to the masculine intelligence. It was Mr. Doman's belief that gold was found in a liquid state. 
He deprecated her intent with considerable enthusiasm, suppressed her sobs with a light hand upon her mouth, laughed in her eyes as he kissed away her tears, and with a cheerful ta-ta went to California to labor for her through the long, loveless years with a strong heart, an alert hope, and a steadfast fidelity that never for a moment forgot what it was about. In the meantime, Miss Matthews had granted a monopoly of her humble talent for sacking up coins to Mr. Joseph Seaman of New York, gambler, by whom it was better appreciated than her commanding genius for unsacking and bestowing them upon his local rivals. Of this latter aptitude, indeed, he manifested his disapproval by an act which secured him the position of clerk of the laundry in the state prison, and for her the sobriquet of split-faced mall. At about this time she wrote to Mr. Doman a touching letter of renunciation, enclosing her photograph to prove that she had no longer a right to indulge the dream of becoming Mrs. Doman, and recounting so graphically her fall from a horse that the staid plug upon which Mr. Doman had ridden into Red Dog to get the letter made vicarious atonement under the spur all the way back to camp. The letter failed in a signal way to accomplish its object. The fidelity which had before been to Mr. Doman a matter of love and duty was thenceforth a matter of honor also, and the photograph, showing the once pretty face sadly disfigured as by the slash of a knife, was duly instated in his affections and its more comely predecessor treated with contumelious neglect. On being informed of this, Miss Matthews, it is only fair to say, appeared less surprised than from the apparently low estimate of Mr. Doman's generosity, which the tone of her former letter attested one would naturally have expected her to be. Soon after, however, her letters grew infrequent, and then ceased altogether. But Mr. Doman had another correspondent, Mr. Barney Bree, of Hurdy Gurdy, formerly of Red Dog. This gentleman, although a notable figure among miners, was not a miner. His knowledge of mining consisted mainly in a marvelous command of its slang, to which he made copious contributions, enriching its vocabulary with a wealth of uncommon phrases more remarkable for their aptness than their refinement and which impressed the unlearned tenderfoot with a lively sense of the profundity of their inventor's acquirements. When not entertaining a circle of admiring auditors from San Francisco or the East, he could commonly be found pursuing the comparatively obscure industry of sweeping out the various dance-houses and purifying the cuspidors. Barney had apparently but two passions in life love of Jefferson Doman, who had once been of some service to him, and love of whiskey, which certainly had not. He had been among the first in the rush to hurdy-gurdy, but had not prospered and had sunk by degrees to the position of grave-digger. This was not a vocation, but Barney in a desultory way turned his trembling hand to it whenever some local misunderstanding at the card-table and his own partial recovery from a prolonged debauch occurred coincidentally in point of time. One day Mr. Doman received at Red Dog a letter with the simple postmark Hurdy Cal, and being occupied with another matter, carelessly thrust it into a chink of his cabin for future perusal. Some two years later it was accidentally dislodged, and he read it, it ran as follows. Hurdy, June 6. Friend Jeff, I've hit her hard in the boneyard. She's blind and lousy. I'm on the divvy. That's me, and mum's my lay till you toot. Yours, Barney. P.S. I've clayed her with scarry. With some knowledge of the general mining camp argot, and of Mr. Bree's private system for the communication of ideas,
Mr. Doman had no difficulty in understanding by this uncommon epistle that Barney, while performing his duty as gravedigger, had uncovered a quartz ledge with no outcroppings, that it was visibly rich in free gold, that, moved by consideration of friendship, he was willing to accept Mr. Doman as a partner, and awaiting that gentleman's declaration of his will in the matter, would discreetly keep the discovery a secret. From the postscript it was plainly inferable that in order to conceal the treasure he had buried above it the mortal part of a person named Scarry. From subsequent events, as related to Mr. Doman at Red Dog, it would appear that before taking this precaution Mr. Bree must have had the thrift to remove a modest competency of the gold. At any rate, it was at about that time that he entered upon that memorable series of potations and treatings which is still one of the cherished traditions of the San Juan Smith country, and is spoken of with respect as far away as Ghost Rock and Lone Hand. At its conclusion, some former citizens of Hurdy-Gurdy, for whom he had performed the last kindly office at the cemetery, made room for him among them, and he rested well. 4. Having finished staking off his claim, Mr. Doman walked back to the center of it, and stood again at the spot where his search among the graves had expired in the exclamation, Scarry. He bent again over the headboard that bore that name, and, as if to reinforce the senses of sight and hearing, ran his forefinger along the rudely carved letters. Re-erecting himself, he appended orally to the simple inscription the shockingly forthright epitaph, She was a holy terror. Had Mr. Doman been required to make these words good with proof, as, considering their somewhat censorious character, he doubtless should have been, he would have found himself embarrassed by the absence of reputable witnesses, and hearsay evidence would have been the best he could command. At the time when Scarry had been prevalent in the mining camps thereabout, when, as the editor of the Hurdy Herald would have phrased it, she was in the plenitude of her power, Mr. Doman's fortunes had been at a low ebb, and he had led the vagrantly laborious life of a prospector. His time had been mostly spent in the mountains, now with one companion, now with another. It was from the admiring recitals of these casual partners, fresh from the various camps, that his judgment of Scarry had been made up. He himself had never had the doubtful advantage of her acquaintance, and the precarious distinction of her favor and when, finally, on the termination of her perverse career at Hurdy-Gurdy, he had read in a chance copy of the Herald her column-long obituary, written by the local humorist of that lively sheet in the highest style of his art, Doman had paid to her memory and to her historiographer's genius the tribute of a smile and chivalrously forgotten her. Standing now at the graveside of this mountain Messalina, he recalled the leading events of her turbulent career, as he had heard them celebrated at his several campfires, and perhaps with an unconscious attempt at self-justification, repeated that she was a holy terror, and sank his pick into her grave up to the handle. At that moment a raven, which had silently settled upon a branch of the blasted tree above his head, solemnly snapped its beak, and uttered its mind about the matter with an approving croak. Pursuing his discovery of free gold with great zeal, which he probably credited to his conscience as a grave-digger, Mr. Barney Bree had made an unusually deep sepulchre, and it was near sunset before Mr. Doman, laboring with the leisurely deliberation of one who has a dead sure thing, and no fear of an adverse claimant's enforcement of a prior right, reached the coffin and uncovered it. When he had done so, he was confronted by a difficulty for which he had made no provision. The coffin, 
a mere flat shell of not very well preserved redwood boards apparently had no handles and it filled the entire bottom of the excavation the best he could do without violating the decent sanctities of the situation was to make the excavation sufficiently longer to enable him to stand at the head of the casket and getting his powerful hands underneath erect it upon its narrower end and this he proceeded to do the approach of night quickened his efforts he had no thought of abandoning his task at this stage to resume it on the morrow under more advantageous conditions the feverish stimulation of cupidity and the fascination of terror held him to his dismal work with an iron authority he no longer idled but wrought with a terrible zeal his head uncovered his outer garments discarded his shirt opened at the neck and thrown back from his breast down which ran sinuous rills of perspiration this hardy and impenitent gold-getter and grave-robber toiled with a giant energy that almost dignified the character of his horrible purpose and when the sun fringes had burned themselves out along the crest-line of the western hills and the full moon had climbed out of the shadows that lay along the purple plain he had erected the coffin upon its foot where it stood propped against the end of the open grave then standing up to his neck in the earth at the opposite extreme of the excavation as he looked at the coffin upon which the moonlight now fell with a full illumination he was thrilled with a sudden terror to observe upon it the startling apparition of a dark human head the shadow of his own for a moment this simple and natural circumstance unnerved him the noise of his labored breathing frightened him and he tried to still it but his bursting lungs would not be denied then laughing half audibly and wholly without spirit he began making movements of his head from side to side in order to compel the apparition to repeat them he found a comforting reassurance in asserting his command over his own shadow he was temporizing making with unconscious prudence a dilatory opposition to an impending catastrophe he felt that invisible forces of evil were closing in upon him and he parleyed for time with the inevitable he now observed in succession several unusual circumstances the surface of the coffin upon which his eyes were fastened was not flat it presented two distinct ridges one longitudinal and the other transverse where these intersected at the widest part there was a corroded metallic plate that reflected the moonlight with a dismal lustre along the outer edges of the coffin at long intervals were rust-eaten heads of nails this frail product of the carpenter's art had been put into the grave the wrong side up perhaps it was one of the humours of the camp a practical manifestation of the facetious spirit that had found literary expression in the topsy-turvy obituary notice from the pen of hurdy-gurdy's great humorist perhaps it had some occult personal signification impenetrable to understandings uninstructed in local traditions a more charitable hypothesis is that it was owing to a misadventure on the part of mr barney bree who making the interment unassisted either by choice for the conservation of his golden secret or through public apathy had committed a blunder which he was afterward unable or unconcerned to rectify however it had come about poor scarry had indubitably been put into the earth face downward when terror and absurdity make alliance the effect is frightful this strong-hearted and daring man this hearty night-worker among the dead this defiant antagonist of darkness and desolation succumbed to a ridiculous surprise he was smitten with a thrilling chill shivered and shook his massive shoulders 
as if to throw off an icy hand. He no longer breathed, and the blood in his veins, unable to abate its impetus, surged hotly beneath his cold skin. Unleavened with oxygen, it mounted to his head and congested his brain. His physical functions had gone over to the enemy. His very heart was arrayed against him. He did not move. He could not have cried out. He needed but a coffin to be dead, as dead as the death that confronted him with only the length of an open grave and the thickness of a rotting plank between. Then, one by one, his senses returned. The tide of terror that had overwhelmed his faculties began to recede. But with the return of his senses he became singularly unconscious of the object of his fear. He saw the moonlight gilding the coffin, but no longer the coffin that it gilded. Raising his eyes and turning his head, he noted, curiously and with surprise, the black branches of the dead tree, and tried to estimate the length of the weather-worn rope that dangled from its ghostly hand. The monotonous barking of distant coyotes affected him as something he had heard years ago in a dream. An owl flapped awkwardly above him on noiseless wings, and he tried to forecast the direction of its flight when it should encounter the cliff that reared its illuminated front a mile away. His hearing took account of a gopher's stealthy tread in the shadow of the cactus. He was intensely observant, his senses were all alert, but he saw not the coffin. As one can gaze at the sun until it looks black and then vanishes, so his mind, having exhausted its capacities of dread, was no longer conscious of the separate existence of anything dreadful. The assassin was cloaking the sword. It was during this lull in the battle that he became sensible of a faint, sickening odor. At first he thought it was that of a rattlesnake and involuntarily tried to look about his feet. They were nearly invisible in the gloom of the grave. A hoarse, gurgling sound, like the death-rattle in a human throat, seemed to come out of the sky, and a moment later a great, black, angular shadow, like the same sound made visible, dropped curving from the topmost branch of the spectral tree, fluttered for an instant before his face, and sailed fiercely away into the mist along the creek. It was the raven. The incident recalled him to a sense of the situation, and again his eyes sought the upright coffin, now illuminated by the moon for half its length. He saw the gleam of the metallic plate, and tried without moving to decipher the inscription. Then he fell to speculating upon what was behind it. His creative imagination presented him a vivid picture. The planks no longer seemed an obstacle to his vision, and he saw the livid corpse of the dead woman, standing in grave clothes and staring vacantly at him with lidless, shrunken eyes. The lower jaw was fallen, the upper lip drawn away from the uncovered teeth. He could make out a mottled pattern on the hollow cheeks, the maculations of decay. By some mysterious process, his mind reverted for the first time that day to the photograph of Mary Matthews. He contrasted its blonde beauty with the forbidding aspect of this dead face, the most beloved object that he knew with the most hideous that he could conceive. The assassin now advanced, and, displaying the blade, laid it against the victim's throat. That is to say, the man became at first dimly, then definitely, aware of an impressive coincidence, a relation, a parallel, between the face on the card and the name on the headboard. The one was disfigured, the other described a disfiguration. The thought took hold of him and shook him. It transformed the face that his imagination had created behind the coffin lid. The contrast became a resemblance, 
the resemblance grew to identity. Remembering the many descriptions of Scarry's personal appearance that he had heard from the gossips of his campfire, he tried with imperfect success to recall the exact nature of the disfiguration that had given the woman her ugly name. And what was lacking in his memory, fancy supplied, stamping it with the validity of conviction. In the maddening attempt to recall such scraps of the woman's history as he had heard, the muscles of his arms and hands were strained to a painful tension, as by an effort to lift a great weight. His body writhed and twisted with the exertion. The tendons of his neck stood out as tense as whipcords, and his breath came in short, sharp gasps. The catastrophe could not be much longer delayed, or the agony of anticipation would leave nothing to be done by the coup de grace of verification. The scarred face behind the lid would slay him through the wood. A movement of the coffin diverted his thought. It came forward to within a foot of his face, growing visibly larger as it approached. The rusted metallic plate, with an inscription illegible in the moonlight, looked him steadily in the eye. Determined not to shrink, he tried to brace his shoulders more firmly against the end of the excavation, and nearly fell backward in the attempt. There was nothing to support him. He had unconsciously moved upon his enemy, clutching the heavy knife that he had drawn from his belt. The coffin had not advanced, and he smiled to think it could not retreat. Lifting his knife, he struck the heavy hilt against the metal plate with all his power. There was a sharp, ringing percussion, and with a dull clatter the whole decayed coffin lid broke in pieces and came away, falling about his feet. The quick and the dead were face to face. The frenzied, shrieking man, the woman standing tranquil in her silences. She was a holy terror. Five. Some months later a party of men and women, belonging to the highest social circles of San Francisco, passed through Hurdy-Gurdy on their way to the Yosemite Valley by a new trail. They halted for dinner, and during its preparation explored the desolate camp. One of the party had been at Hurdy-Gurdy in the days of its glory. He had indeed been one of its prominent citizens, and it used to be said that more money passed over his faro table in any one night than over those of all his competitors in a week. But being now a millionaire engaged in greater enterprises, he did not deem these early successes of sufficient importance to merit the distinction of remark. His invalid wife, a lady famous in San Francisco for the costly nature of her entertainments and her exacting rigor with regard to the social position and antecedents of those who attended them, accompanied the expedition. During a stroll among the shanties of the abandoned camp, Mr. Porfer directed the attention of his wife and friends to a dead tree on a low hill beyond Injun Creek. As I told you, he said, I passed through this camp in 1852, and was told that no fewer than five men had been hanged here by vigilantes at different times, and all on that tree. If I am not mistaken, a rope is dangling from it yet. Let us go over and see the place. Mr. Porfer did not add that the rope in question was perhaps the very one from whose fatal embrace his own neck had once had an escape so narrow that an hour's delay in taking himself out of that region would have spanned it. Proceeding leisurely down the creek to a convenient crossing, the party came upon the cleanly picked skeleton of an animal which Mr. Porfer, after due examination, pronounced to be that of an ass. The distinguishing ears were gone, but much of the inedible head had been spared by the beasts and birds, and the stout bridle of horsehair was intact, as was the riata, of similar material, connecting it with a picket pin still firmly sunken in the earth. 
The wooden and metallic elements of a miner's kit lay nearby. The customary remarks were made, cynical on the part of the men, sentimental and refined by the lady. A little later they stood by the tree in the cemetery, and Mr. Porfer sufficiently unbent from his dignity to place himself beneath the rotten rope and confidently lay a coil of it about his neck, somewhat, it appeared, to his own satisfaction, but greatly to the horror of his wife, to whose sensibilities the performance gave a smart shock. An exclamation from one of the party gathered them all about an open grave, at the bottom of which they saw a confused mass of human bones and the broken remnants of a coffin. Coyotes and buzzards had performed the last sad rites for pretty much all else. Two skulls were visible, and in order to investigate this somewhat unusual redundancy, one of the younger men had the hardihood to spring into the grave and hand them up to another before mrs porfer could indicate her marked disapproval of so shocking an act which nevertheless she did with considerable feeling and in very choice words pursuing his search among the dismal debris at the bottom of the grave the young man next handed up a rusted coffin plate with a rudely cut inscription which with difficulty Mr. Porfer deciphered and read aloud, with an earnest and not altogether unsuccessful attempt at the dramatic effect which he deemed befitting to the occasion and his rhetorical abilities. Manuelita Murphy, born at the Mission San Pedro, died in hurdy-gurdy, aged forty-seven, hells full of such in deference to the piety of the reader and the nerves of mrs porfer's fastidious sisterhood of both sexes let us not touch upon the painful impression produced by this uncommon inscription further than to say that the elocutionary powers of mr porfer had never before met with so spontaneous and overwhelming recognition the next morsel that rewarded the ghoul in the grave was a long tangle of black hair defiled with clay. But this was such an anticlimax that it received little attention. Suddenly, with a short exclamation and a gesture of excitement, the young man unearthed a fragment of grayish rock, and after a hurried inspection handed it up to Mr. Porfer. As the sunlight fell upon it, it glittered with a yellow luster, it was thickly studded with gleaming points. Mr. Porfer snatched it, bent his head over it a moment, and threw it lightly away with the simple remark, Iron pyrites, fool's gold. The young man in the discovery shaft was a trifle disconcerted, apparently. Meanwhile, Mrs. Porfer, unable longer to endure the disagreeable business, had walked back to the tree and seated herself at its root while rearranging a tress of golden hair which had slipped from its confinement she was attracted by what appeared to be and really was the fragment of an old coat looking about to assure herself that so unladylike an act was not observed she thrust her jewelled hand into the exposed breast pocket and drew out a mouldy pocket-book its contents were as follows one bundle of letters, postmarked Elizabethtown, New Jersey, one circle of blonde hair tied with a ribbon, one photograph of a beautiful girl, one ditto of same, singularly disfigured, one name on back of photograph, Jefferson Doman. A few moments later, a group of anxious gentlemen surrounded Mrs. Porfer as she sat motionless at the foot of the tree, her head dropped forward, her fingers clutching a crushed photograph. Her husband raised her head, exposing a face ghastly white, except the long deforming cicatrix, familiar to all her friends, which no art could ever hide, and which now traversed the pallor of her countenance like a visible curse. Mary Matthews Porfer had the bad luck to be dead. 
If you like the video, put a like. Subscribe to the channel and click on the bell to not miss our new videos.